Uh, hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to the NCCR Automation Seminar Series. Thanks for joining us today. So first of uh, all, I would like to thank uh, our guest speaker today, uh, Professor Thierry Prodome uh, from uh, Luzerne University. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, I will uh, start with a short introduction and then uh, leave the floor for uh, Theory for the presentation. Uh, professor Thierry uh, Podom uh, is currently a professor at Luzern University of uh, Applied Science and Arts, uh, where he joined in 2009 and uh, he leads the Competence Center Autonomous Systems and Robotics. Uh, he received his uh, master degree from uh, INPG, uh, Institut National Polytechnic de Grenoble. Uh, and his PhD from EPFL in process control. And before joining uh, the Lausanne uh, University of Applied Science and Arts, he was uh, held, uh, he was having different positions at uh, Rochada that's care for three years uh, where uh, <clears throat> he was actually uh, working on model-based algorithms to help patients with diabetes dose uh, and uh, after that, uh, he joined Tuzan University. His research interest includes the development of advanced algorithms as well as their implementation in uh, industrial environments. Thank you very much again uh, for uh, the presentation and we look uh, forward to, uh, to it. Thank you very much and floor is yours. Thank you, Vahid, for this introduction and uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this presentation. Um, I will. I would like to present you today this this project entitled um, "Robot-based Bean Picking." So you can see different names here in the upper part of my first slide. First, the Lucerne University of Applied Sciences, and also these two companies, Solprag and Kofatech. All of them, they were they were involved uh, in the project. Some. Um, basic checks and research they were done uh, on the university side. And then these two companies, they were more or less in charge of the programming of the industrialization of the, of the solution. Um, if you are active in industrial automation, machine tools, I'm pretty sure that you have heard about, about bin picking. The basic idea behind that is that you should, um, you have a robot that can pick different objects in a box and place them at another location. That's the most, that's the very basic idea. And a few years back to, to do the same, uh, you had to invest lots of money in the so-called feeder. And these feeder were very expensive first. They, were, they are very fast, but they, have, they are well they are tuned for one object. That's the most uh, obvious limitations in this kind of approach, very fast, but very often only one, only one object. And we will see later on, bean picking is much more flexible. Well, that's the idea at least, that you pick one object at time T0, but if you want to pick another object then in two weeks, in a month, in a year, then it should be easy with a reasonable burden than to reconfigure the, 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 the plant so that it can pick, it can fit and different objects. So that's the basic idea, the motivation for this been picking application robot based because the central element in the solution is an industrial robot so that's the idea um, a few words about this project of so bin picking it's uh, a general expression and then the project that i would like to present today is with um, this kind of objects you can see here these cones these are fireworks um, so they are they are being produced here in as a close to Lucerne. So at the beginning, you have these cones, uh, they are empty. And then first they are being filled with powder, then they are being closed, and then they are basically being thrown in a box. And then the result of that is this picture here. Okay, in this corner, you have these cones. They are in this box, randomly positioned with very different orientation um and you don't know where they are so that's the idea the, the size of the box is um maybe you also i'm quite sure that you know what the euro palette is 
So it's basically a Euro pallet. So it's 1,200 millimeters long. It's 800, 800 millimeters wide. And then on top of the pallet, you have a box, which is then one meter high. So that's the working volume. Um, a few years back, so five years back, uh, these cones, they were being picked by hand. So you had one or two manual workers and then all day long, eight hours per day, they pick one cone after the other and then put them on a conveyor. And then uh, that's the main motivation for this bin picking. It was um, then to, how can I put that? Um, it's obvious to anybody that this job is not really uh, appealing. Uh, it's very repetitive. It's, uh, and you have to bend 5,000 times per day in the box. So it has some obvious consequences on your health. And that's the main trigger for this project. And then uh, you have different cone sizes. So at the beginning, it was, it's also at the moment, it's only four different sizes. But when we were involved in the first discussions, then the client had in mind then to develop additional products with different sizes. So from, from the very beginning, the flexibility was a key part in the solution. Good. So that's the, the starting situation. And then if um, we want to derive some goals, some specifications, then the, the first goal is then these cones, they should be picked by a robot, by a machine in an automatic way and placed on a conveyor without human intervention. So that's the basic idea. Okay. Um, we did not expect then this robot-based bin picking process to be faster than the human worker. No needs for that. So the, the specification with regards to number of cones per day is still around 5,000 up to 6,000 in eight hours. So that means it means more or less that you should be able then to pick a cone every five seconds. So that's the, the goal as far as speed is concerned. And this flexibility, the possibility to switch from one cone size to the other, it should be able, it should be possible then to switch from one cone size to another cone size uh, in less than five minutes. And then the cell has to be as compact as possible. So these are the goals. Okay, so basically to replace the human uh, worker um, by, by, by a robot based and, and, uh, application. So that's the basic, the basic idea. The cell, uh, the roof concept that we envision, been picking first because of this need for flexibility, these future needs for different objects with different geometry, with different sizes. So for us, it was clear from, from the very beginning, we cannot go for a classic feeder. We have to envision a bean picking application. And then again, the central element in the bean picking application is an industrial robot arm. So I will explain later on how, how we choose this, uh, this robot. Um, but it was clear from the very beginning, if you think about industrial robots, now you have the classical old fashioned industrial robots for these robots, you need a cell around the robot for obvious safety reasons. But you, have, you now have the so-called collaborative robots. And five years back, uh, these collaborative robots, they were too small, uh, too slow. Uh, today, maybe that would be, we might consider them, but five years back, there were no collaborative robot that could fulfill this task. So we then stick to industrial robot. Part of the, of the application is the gripper. So it might sound uh, obvious, yeah, we need a gripper, but we will see later on that it was not that easy then to find, to design the right gripper for this application. And then you need a 3D sensor because you have the volume, okay? Again, the box one meter high, okay? One meter large, long, one meter wide, more or less one cubic meter, the wall volume. And then you have these cones in this box randomly position with random orientation. So you have to have a sensor to locate to locate the cones in the box. The sensor alone is not enough. You have to combine then the sensor with a 3D matching algorithm, okay, some intelligence to find, to find the objects in the scene. So that's the goal. And then also you need some intelligence to compute the gripping position. Okay, if you think cones and then you have to grip the cone, you have to pick the cone, then 
you have different options, different locations, where to pick it, how do you choose the best one? Okay, you have to find a position which is reachable by the, by the, by the robot, which is accessible, and you have to find also a motion for the robot, which is again collision free, fast, and so on. So you have these two, uh, these two goals that you have to tackle to find a gripping position and to compute a collision free, fast, feasible trajectory for the robot. And then at the beginning of the projects, um, when we try to identify the, the, the challenges in these different work packages, we thought, okay, the 3D part is going to be a big challenge. That was our first thought. So because we didn't know at the beginning uh, what kind of sensors were available, whether they were good enough, industrial grade, this kind of, this kind of, of, of problems we, we foresaw at the beginning of the project. And even in algorithm, we thought that we would have to develop our own algorithm to do the 3D matching because we were not really aware of the different libraries that were available at that time. So this is the challenges that we identified at the beginning of the projects. But uh, the, the truth is that it was not really challenging. So to be very honest, I will explain later on how we solved that part. The 3D sensor is available, can be bought off the shelf. And as far as algorithms is concerned, they can be they can be bought as well, and they are good enough. So the challenges were really then the gripper, and then the last point, the intelligence to compute the gripping positions, and then the path planning. These these were the, the real challenges in in this project. The robot, um, if you have to to pick up the best robot for your application, so basically what you do is you try to define the workspace. So the workspace is the volume that has to be accessible to the robot, but it's not only the volume, it's also then the different orientations. Okay. And these two aspects together, the volumes and then the different orientations that have to be um, reachable by the end effect of the robot that gives you the workspace and that tells you which, which robot you should choose. So here in this case, it was, it was quite obvious at the beginning that the kinematic that we needed for that application was the one of a so-called six axis industrial then robot arm. The main reason is the different orientations that we have to be able then to, to achieve to reach with the tool. Okay, so if you look at the cones here in the box, it's quite obvious that their orientations can be almost anything. Okay, and if you want to be able then to, to pick them, then your gripper will have to be able then to also then to, to, to have this the, this different orientation. So that was the motivation for this kinematic. Okay. So six axis industrial robot arm, and then it was decided to go for this Mitsubishi robot because the partner that we used to work with was more or less than the Mitsubishi then, uh, uh, represent, uh, representative. And then there was no objections also to go for that robot. The payload, seven kilo, the, the biggest, the largest cone is more or less two kilos. So the, the weight of the, the, the biggest uh, cone is two kilo more or less. You have the gripper itself, one, two kilos and some, some margin, and then you go for six, seven kilos. So that's the reason why uh, we decided then to go for the seven kilos payload. The radius, so you can see here on the right hand side, a, a screenshot of the uh, official documentation for this robot. And then you can see here the walking uh, uh, space. And then you have this, uh, 900 millimeter radius okay so if the robot is completely stretched then it can reach then uh, this 910 millimeters so it's not one meter but you have to keep in mind that this is for the position of the end effector and then here on on the flange of the robot then you will have to mount a gripper and then the gripper itself would be 20 centimeters long and then the robot together with the gripper it would be more than one meter long so it should be possible with this robot together with the right gripper than to reach every corner than in the box. A few words about the precisions of this kind of devices. So very often what the manufacturers gives you is the so-called uh, repeatability. Okay, so it tells you that if you want to, to go to the same point two times, then it will be, you will be more or less than uh, 0.02 or two millimeters than uh, besides than the point. Okay, but you don't get any information about the absolute 
the absolute precision of such a device. It's very difficult. So that's the, the, the robot that we, that we envision. As far as the cell is concerned, um, the cell was already available. When this company uh, got in touch with us, um, they, have, they had tried already, to be honest, then to, to develop the software and then the, the, the algorithm with another company. It did, it did not work. That's the reason why they got in touch with us. But the cell was given already. So we were allowed then to question the cell, then to envision some modifications if needed, but they are associated with additional cost. And of course, what we were told is it would be great if you could take the cell as it is uh, without any modification. And as you can see in this cell, you can recognize the box here and you have the conveyor and you can see that the cell itself is barely larger than the box. And then the, there's only one place where the robots can be mounted, it's here. So the, the robot will be mounted horizontally. And then it will, then if the robot stretched, then it's positioned like this. And then it will, the robot will have to bend in the box to pick the cones. But you can see the challenge here. It's very, very small. It's very narrow, everything. Okay, so you will have lots of possibilities for collisions. Okay, and even to find, to find a feasible trajectory from one corner of the box up to the conveyor, it's going to be a very a, a big challenge. So we had to question the cell. And what we did to question the cell is we programmed the cell in a so-called offline programming environment. And we used a software called uh, RoboDK. And in this kind of software, you can program your cell. You can import your, your robot. Um, you can import different CAD components like the box, like the cones, and then you can check everything. So you can check whether you can access all of the points with all of the orientations that you, that you envision. So you can check that, that, that your cell has been designed the right way. Okay? So just to give you an idea, I will switch to this software. This, that, this is the software and this is the cell. Okay, so here you recognize the, the conveyor. We have the robot here. We have the box here. And I don't have any cones here, but I can add cones of different sizes in the box. Okay? And then I can check that I can reach the cones wherever they are, whatever the orientation. Okay? Because you can play with the robot, so I can play with the different here joints. Okay? You have some options up there to check the collisions. And you can link that to some Python programs or .NET programs to, to generate cones everywhere, to test different strategies for, for the path planning, check the collisions, and so on. So that's the tool that we use at every step of the project. So first, just to check that the cell and the robot, then, that they were fine, that we could go everywhere with the right orientation. And that was okay, we could validate that part. The cell is fine, the robot is fine. So the guys before us, they did a good job actually as far as the cell design and the robot choice is concerned. And then we could move on then to the next step, which was the design of the gripper. So again, we use the same tool. You can see the gripper here, okay? So a gripper, it means the length, the angle, how many suction caps, what kind of suction caps, uh, how, what is the height, the height of the suction caps, and so on. All this kind of stuff that could be tested in this simulation environment. So this is, a, uh, today we would use the term digital twins for that. Okay. That is the fashion term for this kind of simulation. The 3D sensor, um, we tested two. So not, we did not test two, actually it's the first sensor that we um, that we used was another one. It was okay. But two years back, we did an update and we decided to go for this new sensor. It was not available then five years back. It's quite new. Um, it's being sold and manufactured by the company ITS and the brand name of this kind of sensor in these companies and sensor. Um, how does it work? That's this stereo vision principle. So you have basically two 2D standard cameras with five megapixel resolution, and you have one very strong projector then in the middle. 
and a spatial texture is being projected on the scene. And then this, each camera then takes take a pictures. And then basically in this two, 2D then representation of the scene, you have to find the patterns that is being projected by the projectors. And then because these two cameras are not at the same position, you have 20 centimeters between these two, then these two patterns, they, they won't be at the same positions in these two cameras. And just by computing the difference and some triangulation, you can then recompute the depth of the pattern. Okay. So it's quite CPU intensive, but it's possible with such a system then to get a so-called point cloud and to get the third dimension, the Z dimension. How do you tune this kind of sensor? So you see you have lenses. So for, the, for, for example, we have them here, uh, a focal length of eight millimeters, but it could be 16. You can have different angles for these two cameras. You can change them here and you can change the baseline. So the distance between the two cameras, it's 20 centimeters, but it can be changed. Okay. And all these parameters together that defines your working volume. Okay. So in our case, it has to be one cubic meter, one meter times one, one times one times one more or less. And the precision is below one millimeter with this kind of device in all directions. Okay. The main problem is this kind of device is not smart. That means it takes pictures okay, with these projectors and then the data are being sent to another computing device. And then it's up to you to design the right, the right hardware to be able to process this information and out of these two 2D pictures to compute then the, the point clouds that you need. So what you need for that is a very powerful graphic card. Okay, so you need a gaming card, okay, typically to be able then to compute this point cloud in a reasonable time. And you see here the 3D representation of this device, because one of the problems that we had, it was the location of this camera in the cell. And I will explain later on uh, how, we, how, we, how we tackle that point. And here you see the data sheet of that camera. So you see the measuring range. So it starts at one meter. So what it tells us is that the camera has to be located at least one meter above the box, and then it sees up to two meters. Okay, so it's the, if you compute the difference between these two numbers, you get one meter, and that's that's exactly the height of our box, so that's fine. But still, the camera has to be one meter above the box. And here you see some information about the accuracy. For example, at one meter distance, then the accuracy is very good, all the three millimeters. But then at two meters, it's slightly above than one millimeter in the Z direction. Okay. And you see also the field of view. So you see at one meter, the field of view is one meter times 900 millimeters. And if you have the dimension of our box in mind, it's not enough because the box is 1,200 millimeter long. So 200 millimeters are missing here. But if you, once you have picked the first cone, then, then it's fine because you see the field of view is getting larger and larger and larger and larger. At two meters, it's almost two meters. Okay. But still at the beginning, we have, we have an issue here. So we have to find a solution because we don't see the world surface when the box is full. Okay. Um, to compute the position of the camera, so again, we use the same, the same software. So what we did is we programmed the cell here. We add the camera. Uh, here you can maybe see the camera up there and what we did is maybe I can you see that what we've programmed is the working volume of the camera that's this green volume here okay and then you can see you can move the box a little bit okay and you can see that there is no way you can see the world surface the upper part of the box with this camera at one meter above the box you miss this 200 millimeters Okay. So what it tells us is that there is a need to move the pallet. Okay. So we have to be able to move the box somehow. Otherwise, it's going to be too tricky then to, 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 to see the wall box. And that's the reason why uh, a so-called pallet pressure was developed with some pneumatic actuators. And then the pallet can be moved at three different positions. So you have the standard position in the middle. But if you want to pick cones in this area, when the box is full, it's not going to be possible. The camera won't see this part, this part. 
and even you can see that if you want to pick a cone here then you have you are going to have a collision within the robot okay. so for to pick cones in this part you will have to move the box under the conveyor and then of course you cannot you cannot pick the cones under the conveyor anymore but you can pick the cones here so what we will do is you will have some 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 intelligence to move to move the pallet back and forth so that we can we can empty the wall box a few uh, point clouds now just to give you some insight about um, these 3D sensors. So this is on the left hand side, this is a screenshot of the so-called viewer that is being also um, that is given by the camera manufacturers. And then you can see the box, you can see the cone, and here you can see then on the right hand side a uh, close, you can get a closer look. Uh, you get some insight about these point clouds. Uh, what I've done also just to give you even more insight is I have uh, opened a typical file that is being generated by this kind of device. And then you can see the points here. Okay. So a point is just X, X, Y, Z coordinate. Okay. And then you get a bunch of points. Okay. And that's what we call the scene, the 3D scene, these point clouds. Okay. And that's what we need. You, we, can, we can see the cones, the cones here. Okay. And this is what this is the next step. So we need an algorithm now to locate the cones in the point clouds. So another look uh, at the point clouds. And again, what you get is for each point, X, Y, Z coordinates. The main problem is the coordinates that you get for these points, they are um, in the camera reference frame. Because you have your camera, get all, all of the information that you get from the camera, it's based on its own reference frame. And this is something that we'll be discussing later on. How do you match the camera frame with the robot frame? So what you need for, oh, sorry, apologize for that. Um, what you need for the 3D matchings is you need also uh, a 3D model of the object of the item that you would like to pick. Okay. So what you do is yeah, you open your favorite CAD software, for example, SolidWorks, and then you program this geometry. It takes five minutes okay, for an experienced user. And then you get the raw CAD model of the, of the, of the objects that you would like to pick. Okay. And of course, you have to associate also a coordinate system somewhere on the surface of, of the cone. Okay. And then you have to prepare the cone. For the 3D matchings, you have to optimize and you have to sample your CAD model. So what we did first is that we cut it. And why uh, did we decide to cut the model? It's, the, the, it's because the camera cannot see the wall model. Okay, if I again, show you the point cloud okay if i zoom here the cone you can see that you see less a little bit more than one third of the wall of the wall surface you cannot see the wall surface it's just impossible okay but still the matching works even if i consider the wall model for the 3d matching it would it would be fine the main problem is the score if you if you do a 3d matching and it, it does not depend on the algorithm that you use. What you will get is you will get a score. So basically the algorithm will tell you uh, which percentage of the surface is seen by the sensor. Okay, and if you have the wall model, you know that you will, you will get a score between 20 and 30%. But if you cut your model, okay, and you reduce it to one third like here, then you expect a score of 100%. And it helps a lot for the sorting of the cones. One of the problems that we, that, that we had at, is that sometimes you have some cones that are above all the cones, but still they are being found. Okay? And how do you know which cones is above the other one? Then it's by looking at the score. Okay? And then that had, it helped us a lot 
before the sorting to cut the model and then to reduce it to one third. And we know if we see 100% of it, we are 100% sure that there are no cones above it and that it can be picked. So that's the basic idea for the basic motiv uh, motivation for cutting the CAD model. It has to be sampled. So that's required by the, by the matching algorithm. Um, and then you have to choose a resolution, so a distance for the sampling. And then very often, this is given by the resolution of your sensor. So if you know that your sensor is, for example, has a precision of one millimeter, then it's a good indication. It tells you that you have to sample your model with maybe something around one millimeter. And then it's a trade-off that has to be found between matching precisions and time. Because if you increase the number of points, then the times for the matching will increase as well. Okay. And then you have to find the right trade-off between, between these, two, these two aspects. Um, let me show you some <clears throat> matching results. So the algorithm used is uh, surface based algorithm. So the basic idea is that you compare points with points, points from the model with points from the scene. You compute the Euclidean distance and you have some uh, least squares uh, objective functions that you minimize. That's the basic idea of you. So nothing, nothing special. And then you see the results here. And you see the point clouds and then the result of the matching. When you match, you can decide uh, how many cones you would like them to match. Okay, so what we do is we have 10 at the moment. Okay, so we would like to see, to, to, see, to locate then 10 cones and then we have to sort, sort them out. Okay, I will explain later on how, how we sort them. But here you can see that, for example, you have the yellow cone has been matched, but is below the red one. So it, it's not a good idea to pick the yellow one. Okay, and this is where this reduced model helps us a lot because for the yellow one, we get a score of maybe 80%. And for the red one, we get a score of 100%. So we know that the yellow one is below another cone and should not be picked. Okay, so we have to pick the red first, the red one first, and then maybe the yellow one. Okay, so this is very, very important. This is crucial. <laughs> the sorting of the of the of the cones. And then again, a few words about uh, the software that we use. So we use the commercial software. We pay for that for the matching. And then again, what we do is that we look for 10 cones and then we sort them out. And then we sort them out according to different criteria. One is the Z value. So the higher the cone, the better, of course. The score, already mentioned. We also sort them out according to the last cone picked. So we would like them to pick not as well, if we want to pick two cones one after the other, we would like them to have a certain distance, not to be too close. Uh, the pickability, so I apologize for this new expression, but what I mean is you have some cones that cannot be picked because the orientation is too exotic and you have no way to pick them. It's just not possible. The orientation is not accessible with the robot. That happens all the time. So you have to check to check the pickability. So here on this slide, it's only one word, but this is very uh, intensive to check this pickability. It's not, it's not an obvious task. And we have some additional minor criteria to do the sorting. Okay, but that's one of the tricky parts in the application to find the right code, the one that you can pick without any collision and the one that you can grip and so on. <clears throat> A few words about the high calibration. As I told you earlier, when you get the points the point clouds of your scene, the points that you get, the data, the value that you get, they are for the camera reference frame. But if you give a job to the robot, it has to be defined in the robot reference frame. So you have to match both. And there are different options to tackle, to handle that task. One of the options is the so-called hand high calibration. I'm oh, sorry. So the basic idea with the hand high calibration is that you mount something special on the robot flange. So you, you, you um, unmount your gripper and then you mount something like that. So it's a special tool, okay? And then you move this tool at different positions with the robot. And then you make sure that the camera, your 3D sensor can see the tool. And then you match the tool. 
So basically, you generate the point clouds and you have a CAD model of the tool and you match it. Okay, so you get the information where is this tool in the camera reference frame. That's the result of your matching algorithm. And because it is mounted on the robot and you know where the robot is, you can compute the transformation matrix between these two coordinate systems. That's the basic, it's very, it's very, it's very easy. What we did is we, did co we computed not only one transformation matrix, but we computed 10, around 10, maybe more, I'm not sure, to be honest, okay? but around 10. And the reason is, is the precision. Because I told you earlier, uh, we don't know how precise these robots are. Okay? And then you have to have some kind of compensation in your system to compensate for this and precision. And one way to compensate for that is by having not only one, but different transformation matrices. So basically you cut your volume in different pieces and for each piece you compute the transformation matrix. And by doing so, you can compensate for all of the unknown that you have in the world chain. And then you don't have to care that much about as long as the repeatability is given, by the robot manufacturers, then you're fine. You're on the safe side. Pass planning, how did we, <clears throat> did we do the pass planning? Um, so again, it was the most tricky part in this project. And one way to handle that was with, again, this uh, offline simulation software. Okay, so what we did is in this software, it's quite easy to generate plenty of different cones with plenty of different orientations. So that's quite easy. You have two, three, four loops, embedded four loops, four position X from 10 to whatever orientation you can, okay, if you have time, you can cover everything. Okay, and then what you can do is for each of these position or pose, so pose is a special term, Pose means position and orientation, if you want. If I say pose, that means both, okay? And for each of these pose, you can then in your offline simulation software, you can simulate very different gripping position, different trajectories with different intermediate points that you have time, okay? You can invest two weeks, two months, it works on its own. It tries and tests and collisions, tries again shift this point left and right, you can have some artificial intelligence, whatever, okay, to handle that. But then at the end, what you get is for each pose, you get a feasible grouping position and a feasible trajectory, and it should be fast enough. And then what you do, of course, you cannot afford these kind of computations online because it takes too much time, but what you do, you do it offline, and then you generate a very complex lookup table Okay, with all of this information. So basically, during operation, when a car is thrown at a certain position with a certain orientation, in new lookup table, you have the right gripping position and then you have the right trajectory. So you pick it up in your lookup table, that's okay. You know for sure 100% that it's going to work. Okay. It's collision free, it's feasible, and you have the picking time. You have the right picking time. So that's that was how we decided to solve the problem. Okay, I'm, I'm not giving too many details because it would be too takes too long, but you have, if you would like to know how we really did that, then just be free to get in touch with me. Nothing new on this slide, I guess. Again, for each pose, a reachable gripping pose is found on saved in the lookup table, a feasible fast trajectory is computed and saved also in the lookup table. And then this lookup table is a gripping pose, is entirely with that. It's a database, okay, in matter of fact, with this, the information concerning the gripping pose and the trajectory that you need then during operation. Gripper design. One slide, but lots of time. <laughs> Again, also the big challenges here, cones are not flat. Okay, so if you want to use a vacuum gripper, if it's flat, it's better. Okay, if it's not flat, maybe it won't, it won't work. Okay, you will have some, some leakage somewhere. So that's one of the problems. Cones are heavy, okay, two kilos. So just imagine when the robot moves at full speed with two kilos, two kilos up on the flange. Okay, if the suction force is not good enough, cones are flying everywhere. 
So at the very beginning, we had plenty of different crashes, okay, cones against the walls, and so it was really Star Wars, kind of. Okay. But then, okay, we had to improve the section surface, we had to change the number of section gaps, and so on. Okay. And then because we have four different cone sizes, then we have two different reapers. One with three, I, it's not actual anymore, we, has, we have one with three section gaps and one with two. And then again, the challenge was that the robot moves fast, the cones are heavy, and the cones should not fly and crash against the cell walls. Okay. We tested 20 different combinations. Of course, they, they, there is some theory that tells you okay, everybody knows, okay, uh, pressure, time, suction surface, these, these force, everybody knows that, but believe me, you have to try. Okay, because yeah, they are so different. It depends also on the type of surface that you have. Okay, it depends on the material that you have. Um, the cones are not clean. You have lots of powder, so you have possible lack. Uh, you have so many parameters that the only way to check is just to test all of the combinations with the robot at full speed to see if the cones fly or not. And it's a huge, it's a huge, it's a it's not difficult, but it's time, it's time intensive. You need lots of time before you find the right combination. A few words about the timing aspects. Um, I give you some hints about how much time the different steps take. The point cloud generation, one second, more or less, the 3D matching, one second. Uh, to sort the cones in the same, isolate the cone to pick one second, three seconds altogether. The robot motion, four seconds. To move down to the cone, to pick it, and then to move back and place the cone, it takes four seconds. Four plus three, seven. Too long. No way, it doesn't work. Okay, we five seconds. Okay, keep in mind, you have to be able to pick a cone every five seconds. It doesn't work. So, what we did is we decided then to perform the vision planning task during the robot motion. Okay, it's not very original, but that's the only way we, we found to tackle that. So, the main problem with that is you don't, when you pick a cone, that's not the last cone you've seen, okay? So you are, you are always one step ahead with the robot movement, if you want, compared to the cones that you have found with the 3D matching. So the big condition is that the scene is more or less frozen, okay? Because if you, if you move all of the cones by picking one, then, then you might have trouble, okay? So that's the main problem with this, with this configuration is, Okay, you see here cone E, cone I, okay, then is being picked here. But if this cone is moved during this operation here, then you won't be able to pick it. That's the reason why we would like to have some distance between two cones that are being picked consecutively. Okay, one cone in one corner and another, the next one in another corner. By doing so, we are sure that the picking of the cone A won't disturb the position of the cone B. And now we are fine, okay? Four seconds, four seconds, four seconds. We are below these five seconds and then we are, we can um, fulfill the requirements. The deployment, a few rods, not too many because uh, I have to stop somehow. Um, you have the field level with the different sensors, actuators, um, the pneumatic actuators, the laser sensors, you have safety components, uh, you have the robot itself and the 3D sensors, that's at the field level. At the automation, we have, we have one PLC from Beckhoff. You have the robot controller, both communicates using Profibus. And then we have our big vision PC with this powerful graphic card to handle the computation of the point clouds. And then we have a control panel with the user interface. So that's more or less without too many details than how the solution has been deployed on the field. Uh, the cell itself, nothing special. Okay, nice, nice color. And you see here the panel, you see here the pallet pressure. Okay, you see here box with the cones and you see here the conveyor here. Okay, and you some inside, that's the Mitsubishi robot mounted horizontally. You see the gripper here. Um, yeah, you don't see the, this was the first cameras. Okay, so again, this was before we did this update to this new camera. A few words about the place strategy. Okay, you have to pick, so you have to pick the cones and then they have to be placed later on on the conveyor. And the main problem, if we, if we analyze the, 
the precision of the whole process, what you can see is that the main sources of uh, unprecision, if I can put it this way, is along the z axis of the cones, okay, along the length here. Okay, so you can have up to five millimeters, one centimeter difference here if you pick two times the same cone. And to compensate for that, we use this laser sensor. So the primary use of this laser sensor is what it was to, to, to see if some cones were on the conveyor already, and then to decide where to put, where to, put to place the next cone. But we misuse this sensor to also know, um, to compensate for this set inaccuracy that we have by picking the cone. Okay. We can explain, I could, I could explain uh, why we have this set inaccuracy, but it would take too long. So you have to believe me, we have some, some inaccuracy along this axis by picking the cone. There are good reasons for that. Um, and then to compensate for that, we, used, we misuse this sensor. So we know that when we breach them, when we break the laser beam, we know that we are at a certain height above the conveyor, and then we have to move that, that far before we can switch off then the, the vacuum creeper. Okay. So we, we use this sensor for two different purposes. Okay. The primary one, where to place the cone along this axis, and then the second one to compensate for the set inaccuracy then uh, at picking. A video maybe uh, to conclude this presentation. <clears throat> So this is the user interface. So the process is being initialized and started. The robot moved to the homing position. These are the smallest cones. So you can see that we have only one section cup here. Accelerate a little bit. Yeah, you can see what happened when the when the, the conveyor stops. Okay, if you have some problems at the next station, then the conveyor will stop. And then we don't see the laser sensor, but the laser sensor is used to to determine then where to put the next the next the next cone. And here what we'll see later on is the When, uh, yeah, this is this is when the box is empty. Uh, I would like to show you also. Yeah, that's the important. So here, this is this reconfiguration. So we we switch from one con size to another con size. So we have to change the gripper. So it takes two three minutes. Homing again, the, you see the pallet being pushed forward. So this box is almost empty. Ah, you see the laser sensor here on the right hand side. We have, we have two actually. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Okay. So this video is available on YouTube. Uh, what else? Um, a few words maybe about our, if I can afford that, by, about our research activities at the Lucerne University of Applied Sciences. Automation, sure, as well, industrial as well as building automation. We have lots of projects also in this area. Process control, 
That was my PhD actually in Lausanne, okay? process control, MPC model, predictive control for building related applications, thermal processes. Robotic, industrial robotic, um, as well as mobile robotic. And we have also then uh, some projects with collaborative then robots. And we have plenty as we have different guys also uh, that are very good at designing software and hardware embedded systems and signal processing. We have two big uh, inner Swiss projects now with uh, hardware design together with signal processing and artificial, artificial intelligence. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have questions, I'd be very happy then to answer them now or later on. Thank you very much, Thierry, for uh, the interesting presentation. Uh, if there are